vulnerability disclosure panel. Uh, we're bringing together several different communities, hopefully to reach a greater consensus, both among the panelists and among everybody here. Uh, everyone here is presumably involved in security in some way, or the press, hopefully press that is involved in security. T t today's panel is going to discuss responsible disclosure of vulnerability information. It's become a hot topic lately as debate rages on the best way to safeguard computers. Uh, Global Intersect has been weighing in heavily in favor of individual responsibility. and there, there is a plausible and workable disclosure metric which suits everyone, but it requires cooperation among everyone. Why is responsible disclosure important? Currently, most security information either gets dumped onto the internet, allowing black hats and script kitties to go wild, or gets sucked into the black hole of corporate America, leaving products unsecured and vulnerable. The path to real security is found in the middle ground. Such a course must enable software companies to create patches by giving them sufficient information about the problem, while also ensuring that the information does not fall into the wrong hands. And although web defacements are annoying, I'm speaking more of corporate espionage, intellectual property theft, augmentations of terrorism, and attacks against critical infrastructure. Why do losses due to attacks increase every year? Why do viruses using known exploits promulgate so rapidly? Why are advisories released immediately after vendor notification? A large part of the answer is the current practices and lack of communication between computer using communities. The most major vulnerability still affecting the entire internet is disclosure itself. Bringing everyone together is a step-by-step -step process. I hope that today's panel will help us all move forward into a relatively more secure and responsible computing age. To that end, please allow me to introduce our panel members. Right. To my right, we have Richard George, Technical Director of the Security Evaluations Group at the National Security Agency. Richard George joined the NSA as a mathematician in 1970 and has worked in the Information Assurance Directorate or its predecessor organizations for 32 years as a crypto mathematician. He currently serves as the technical director of the Security Evaluations Group, which is responsible for evaluating security solutions used by the Department of Defense and Intelligence community. To his right is Scott Culp, manager of the Security Response Center at Microsoft Corporation. Scott Culp uh, is the manager of, of the Security Response Center, which he helped to found in 1998. Virtually all of his 20-year career has involved security in some capacity. Topics he tackles include network security, cryptography, and security certifications. To his right is Marcus Sachs, Director for Communication Infrastructure and Protection at the Office of Cyberspace Security at the White House. As Director and a staff member of the President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board, Marcus Sachs works with U.S. government agencies in the private sector on matters relating to the protection and security of the nation's telecommunications and inf internet infrastructures. In addition, he's the primary action officer for coordination with the National Communication System and Department of Defense on matters relating to cyberspace security. To his right is Dave Farrell. Uh, Dave Farrell is the Senior Research Engineer for the Cyber Defense Research Center and the, and the Strategic Research and SRI International. T he's got 20 plus years as a sysadmin in network design, security testing, and red teaming. He currently works on red teams for DARPA and DOD research and development projects. To his right is Tom Parker, also known as MRX. He's the Director of Research for Global Intersect. Tom's one of Britain's most prolific security consultants. In addition to contractual work for some of the world's largest uh, IT firms, Mr. Parker's best known for his vulnerability research on a wide range of platforms and commercial products. As director of research for Global Intersect, he plays a leading role in developing key relationships between GIS and the public and private sector communities. Uh, each of our panelists is gonna offer a brief statement and then we'll go to uh, designated topics of discussion around responsible disclosure and then we'll take questions from the audience. So oh, we can take questions first. <laughs> Go ahead. What, what am I doing? Yeah, no, five, 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 minute, five minute uh, <laughs> five minutes on expletive. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we're yeah, we'll tell you about carving ducks. Okay, I, I used up most of my five minutes this morning and uh, let me just say that uh, I think I still believe what I said uh, this morning, that there's a, there's a responsible way to deal with vulnerabilities and we all have a, a stake in doing it the right way. We have to work together. We have to go to first to the vendor. I mean, in, in my job, I have a lot of exposure to problems. Uh, going to a customer doesn't work. Going to a customer with mitigation helps a little bit 
But the, the real way we win is by going to a vendor, giving them the opportunity to come up with a real solution, going to the customer and say, look, here's the real solution that this vendor provides. You gotta, you gotta take care of this. This is a serious problem. Put the patch in place, take care of it, make your system better. Uh, so it's a multi-step process, but, th but the first step is always get to the vendor with the information and get to them with the right information. Don't tell them, hey, I found a hole, or hey, here's an attack. They, and Scott can go into more detail what he'd like to see, but you've got to get, get them enough information that they know how to handle it in an expeditious way and actually solve the problem. And then you work with the vendor to make sure that what they do actually does solve the problem. That's all I want to say. Does it have to be on? I was never good with this technical stuff. <laughs> I want to echo what Dickie was saying. Um, most vendors, and I certainly count Microsoft among them, want to fix security vulnerabilities when they're found in our software. Um, we want to work with, with people who find, the, uh, who find the vulnerabilities, and we want to get patches out to our customers. Um, I don't want to paint uh, too negative a picture uh, with respect to the, to the state of the world right now. Do we need to make it a lot better? Yeah, we sure do. But I want to point, point out one place where I think we've made a lot of progress over the past year. There seems to be, and certainly I'm speaking primarily from my role as Microsoft, but in talking with colleagues around the industry, both in terms, bo both, uh, both, who, uh, both vendors and, and researchers, there's a growing sense that we are all coming to a consensus around the fact that security patches really need to be developed as part of the overall software ecosystem. We saw last year, in the case of vulnerabilities affecting Microsoft products, Code Red and Nimda, and, um, and in some other instances involving other vendors' products, that vendors were developing patches. The patches weren't getting onto people's systems because they were too hard to deploy, they weren't easily managed, people perceived that there might be quality problems, and so on. Patches never got onto people's systems. And so when the attacks came, those systems were unprotected, and we saw far greater damage than really needed to, to have occurred. The heartening sign that I've seen over the past year is an increasing, um, an increasing understanding that, that the right way to measure how we're handling security vulnerabilities is not how fast can we crank a patch out and drop it on the internet but instead how fast can we get a, a critical mass of customers' machines patched and protected against the vulnerability? That's the thing we've got to be measuring. And that's where we need help from the people in the, uh, in the research community. And, um, and, and thankfully, we've been seeing it uh, to a greater and greater extent. Um, what we've found over the past year is that, is that security researchers are much more cognizant of the fact that we're going to have to localize these patches. We're going to have to put them out in 30 different uh, languages. That we're going to need to use, uh, not only have manual uh, downloads available for patches, but also have automated, uh, automated patching systems ready to go. That we're going to have to have the ability to, to query, for, for an administrator to query his or her own system and see which patches they need and so on and so forth. We'll probably talk about those in more detail as the, as the Q&A goes forward. But the one thing that I, the, you know, so, so as, as we talk about all the problems, I do want to make sure that we keep in mind that we are making some progress. We are seeing better uptake on patches, and we think that that's, and, and I believe that's the, that's the long-term direction to, uh, toward, uh, uh, toward making security patches a lot more effective. So, um, you know, we want to we wanna continue working with the rest of the industry, but we are starting to see some progress. I'm going to use the unsecure wireless microphone. Uh, three things. I like the term ecosystem because I think that that really applies here. Uh, hopefully, most of y'all were awake this morning at uh, 8.05, 8.10, roughly, when my boss did the keynote. And he did briefly mention uh, responsible disclosure. And just to reiterate what he said for those of y'all who weren't there is that uh, we in the White House definitely want things to be as direct as possible. If um, Are we done? Good. Nope, not done yet. It's the AV. 
It must be. We'll use this one. It seems to work better. If it's uh, your line of work, your hobby, your interest, whatever, to find vulnerabilities um, and bring them to their logical conclusion, the best thing, of course, is to bring it straight to the vendor, let them uh, develop the, the uh, work around the patch, whatever, and get the, the word out properly. If the vendor is not responsive to your efforts, then a secondary party, such as CERT-CC, is the next best place to go. And in fact, alerting CERT-CC and others that do their type of work is very appropriate because they have inroads into vendors and such that individuals may not have. If that doesn't work, unfortunately, a lot of people will result to then um, uh, issuing the uh, announcement themselves or claiming credit for it or trying to come up with some way to exploit what they've developed. Um, that to us seems to be a little on the irresponsible end. If, if the vendor is not responsive, uh, please come through us. We'll try and affect the change, but definitely use the CERT CC route or something similar. The piece about the ecosystem is, uh, is an interesting model. If we eliminate the ability to report vulnerabilities, in other words, if we take the stand that says, if a company issues software, it's illegal to go look for problems, uh, it's illegal to report problems, we want to discourage anything like that, what we wind up doing is creating a situation much like the National Forestry Service has on their hands. For the last 75 years or so, they've, they've done a very good job of preventing forest fires, but unfortunately they've created tinder boxes in many national forests where the, the natural effort of lightning strikes that burn out the underbrush and just kind of keep things at a nice clean state builds up. And so you may have a situation where several years go by and no vulnerabilities are reported, uh, no exploits, no nothing, but yet they're still there. And there's at some point a flash, a lightning strike, whatever it is that sets off a wildfire across the internet. Uh, that we want to avoid. So it actually is healthy to try and find these vulnerabilities, get them reported, get them worked out, because the ecosystem of the internet and of the software world needs that type of effort ongoing. The third thing, and this is something we're looking at long term, is what can we do to just try and do away with this vulnerability problem in the first place? What are we doing wrong as software engineers? Why, why do we have buggy software? And what can we do for the next generation? For those of us who've got kids that are in elementary school or kindergarten or such, when they grow up, when they go through high school, they go through college, they become software engineers, whatever they decide to do, how do we affect their minds now so that as they're creating the next generation and we're sitting in our rocking chairs enjoying sunsets, that they don't have to put up with this. They've got fairly bug-free code that it works well and it's the embedded systems pretty much out of the box do as they're supposed to do. That's long range. We won't solve that problem today, but we're working on that for the next generation. So uh, we, we are really putting a lot of effort into both of those, and we realize that the second one is going to take many years to pay off, but it is something that needs to be worked on. It, it sounds uh, great that we could just go ahead and work all together and tell everybody about vulnerabilities behind closed doors and get them fixed and whatnot. I'm, I'm not sure what the, the motivation would be. I mean, at some point, you know, someone wins. Someone knows everything, right? So we have, you know, a state where there's no vulnerabilities. We think there's always this gray area where someone knows about a vulnerability and maybe isn't telling, maybe he's waiting. Um, I guess from the government perspective, we might look at certain other adversaries besides the uh, well-known hacker, I guess, that we read about all the time, uh, where it's just pretty much malicious code that runs around and, and really doesn't do a whole lot. There's other things that, that, uh, that go on that, that we probably don't see. There are vulnerabilities that we haven't discovered and we, we may never. But there are other mitigations besides putting a Band-Aid out there. And, and I consider patches Band-Aids for the most part. Uh, because they're reactionary and they're point fixes. Um, and you, know, you mentioned fit better software engineering, security engineering. Uh, that's going to look at the bigger picture. And when we start looking at systems of systems and dependency issues, you're not going to see that looking at individual software. So there is no patch for that. Uh, the other part of that is if you do find a vulnerability, um, in, in the work I do, we do vulnerability discovery. I mean, we're, we're red teaming uh, some of the research systems that will be out there to, to work on problems of today and tomorrow. We're also working on live networks and, and finding issues. Uh, when we do that, 
you know, we, we give it back to the owners of the network. We don't go ahead and get involved in the loop of talking to the vendors and saying, you have a problem. Uh, a lot of that is because it involves more than one thing. And so those are a lot harder to get worked on because now you have multiple vendors involved and it's for a specific installation, um, you know, maybe a network that someone can't reach and it's very hard to set up and test. So um, I, I, I don't know how, you know, I don't have any of the answers actually. Um, I, you know, I've heard these guys talk about how we could share vulnerabilities, uh, information, again, behind closed doors, get things fixed, get it out there. And then I heard this morning, you know, trying to, uh, I was going to say place blame, but I mean a fix of responsibility. Where do you do it? Where does it stop? Is it, is it at the ISP? Is it at the individuals? Is it, you know, the corporations in between? Or does the government need to step in and, and oversee something? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, there may be some people who, who are hesitant, perhaps, to deal with the government. Um, you know, maybe it's that big brother thing, lack of trust. Uh, the other part of that is, you know, I've dealt with CERT before, and, I, you know, I see their advisories. So their advisories come out, they've gotten better, but their advisories come out pretty late. They uh, have certain formulas for thresholds. If they don't get, you know, some number of reports, you're not going to hear about it. And I think in some ways, some of those vulnerabilities are a lot more interesting and, uh, maybe indicate a higher level adversary that uh, maybe certain people need to worry about, but maybe not everyone. And we don't hear a lot about that because it's not the masses. It's not, you know, the guy at the end of the cable modem or whatever becoming a, a DDoS zombie and, you know, everybody getting excited about it. So uh, there's, there's the aspect of intent. Uh, there's various levels of sophistication adversaries. Uh, and we kind of have been lumping them together and I think we need to start pulling that apart. And, and as the government, you know, uh, we are worried about pretty much the whole spectrum, unfortunately, because a lot of them manifest themselves the same way. Uh, when we sit and look through a lot of data uh, from various IDSs, firewalls, routers, uh, logs on machines, trying to put these things together, it's not always obvious who's doing it and why, but we know we have to defend against it, at least initially. I'll shut up for now. I'm uh, sure all of us here have been uh, involved in the various vulnerability disclosure discussions that have been going on over the last year or so. Um, each of us have our own personal opinions. Some of us echo the opinions of our employers or the offices we work for. Um, one of the main points of uh, the, the panel today was not to discuss the ethics of vulnerability disclosure, but to try and find a consensus amongst uh, the individual communities. Um, I sat in a, uh, in a discussion a week ago in front of Congress um, where a handful of representatives from Department of Energy, NIPC, um, Critical Infrastructure sat down and discussed their opinions on uh, if America's critical systems were at threat from cyber terrorism. Um, the individuals each stated their, their opinions, they stated their opinions of their particular department but did not uh, find any consensus. They only had one technical person, uh, Mark Mayfoot from EI, sat there, um, but he didn't really touch on any instances of uh, hackers being used, utilized by terrorists or anything like that. Um, so I, I guess one of the points we put the panel today was to, to get a member of each community uh, to try and reach some kind of consensus. One of the things we will be discussing later on is um, hypothesizing if, there, if there's a plausible, perfect disclosure metric, um, i.e., is it possible to um, disclose vulnerabilities in a way that protect critical infrastructures first? Uh, so if, Mike, go ahead. Okay. That, that's, a, that's a fairly good lead into the, the first topic that I, that I have on our agenda, it, and, and that is, what does responsible disclosure mean versus there, there are all sorts of policies of disclosure. There are all sorts of ways that people discover information and either send it to the market, send it to bug track, send it to the vendors. I, I'd like to develop both among the panelists and, and among the audience a, some sort of general 
idea of what the best way, what the most secure way is from point A where someone realizes, hey, there's a vulnerability in this product or in this code to point Z where everyone's systems are no longer vulnerable to that code. So comments would be wonderful. Okay, I'll jump in first. <clears throat> in, an, in a nutshell, um, responsible security vulnerability handling means handling, uh, means handling the vulnerability in a way that, um, that minimizes the harm that can be done to, a, to, uh, to users through it. All the other stuff, the processes, what happens when, who do you talk to, how many days, all that kind of stuff, those are all mechanics. We're gonna know that, we're going to know that we have um, found a responsible vulnerability uh, reporting process when we start to see um, patches getting onto systems faster, when we start seeing uh, vulnerabilities not being exploited, when we start seeing basically when we start seeing security being improved. And the specific, you know, processes there are probably a, there are probably a dozen different ways we can do it, but that end goal is the is the, is the main thing. Um, not if you're a vendor, not hiding the vulnerability if you're a finder, not treating the vulnerability as some kind of a fungible commodity, mm -hmm. um, but instead keeping foremost in all of our minds that we're supposed to, to all share the interests of the people who are using our systems. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, cause as little harm as possible. And in addition to dealing with the vulnerability, that means you have to know what kind of information you're going to hand to whomever. Uh, for me, if I'm going to a user, I do not want to tell the user what the vulnerability is, and I don't want to tell the user what the attack is. Uh, that, that can really cause problems. For example, if I, if I have a Navy system, I tell the Navy, and I wind up telling some system admin in the Navy, and he decides to see if it works on the White House, and it winds up working on the White House. I am screwed. Uh, you know, there, there's no way I can defend having disclosed that vulnerability to some guy who then can, can work it on somebody. You've got to tell the user that there's a risk and give him guidance on how to mitigate the risk. And often the best way to do that is by waiting until the vendor has had a chance to address it. But, but it, that was right on. You've got to minimize the risk that you're putting the user at. And then that, to me, what is what is, is responsible in this case. How oh, good? Uh, I'm referring to the lawsuit that HP recently brought against Snowsoft um, for an exploit that they posted. Marcus, you said that what you don't want to see is some kind of um, activity, some kind of lawsuit exactly like this brought against companies or vulnerability researchers that would then prevent researchers from bringing vulnerabilities to light. So now we have a suit from, from HP that's exactly that. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to jump in. Because uh, I've had exactly that situation, and not in the real recent past, but uh, a couple of years ago, where we would be dealing with companies, we would bring them in, and the, the way we deal with them with vulnerabilities, we have to go through a process which puts the vulnerability in, in a way that we can talk in an unclassified way to, to the vendor. We sign an NDA with the vendor which says we'll treat it as pri pri proprietary information, that specs, and, and we uh, don't disclose it to anyone else, okay? I've had several companies come in and refuse to sign the NDA because they say, if we tell them what the problem is, then, then they have knowledge about it, they have to fix it, and they're liable for anything. Whereas if they don't know about it, they're not liable. So I, I think that's a terrible response, and I think that's exactly why we don't want to see this kind of legal problem. So you're saying you disagree with the HP lawsuit then? I'm saying, right, I, I'm agreeing that I would prefer not to see a lawsuit like that. I think that hinders our ability to get vulnerabilities fixed. Okay, what I'm seeing here is HP trying to take two, basically winning on both sides here. 
they don't want to address the vulnerability, which Snowsoft says that they were late, um, they were told about it, they didn't act on it. And yet they're turning around and doing what you're saying, you want responsible um, disclosure. But HP now, instead of going to Snowsoft and talking with them reasonably and saying, we don't like the fact that this exploit is there, they're just taking them to court. So it seems that in every instance we have, not only in, in disclosing a vulnerability, but then in the recourse, um, the companies have the top hand in every, in every instance. I, I'd like to jump in there quickly. Um, we're actually quite, um, GIS is quite close to Snowsoft, um, so I've actually uh, been uh, Kevin Finisterre, who's one of the uh, directors of Snowsoft, and uh, FaZe, who I also know. Um, the, the situation. Is, is he, sorry, is he from England? Phased? Phased, correct, yeah. Um, in the ideal disclosure uh, metric, the vulnerability would be discovered in a controlled environment. Um, in the case of the True64 vulnerability, which, which is the one you mentioned, um, it was not discovered in a controlled environment. Snowsoft have uh, systems which consultants may freely access. Uh, they have, when, when they log on to the system, they see a, uh, a disclaimer which says that you can't release any information out of this system, but it, 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 so technically Snowsoft could sue the consultant. Um, but, but basically, what ha he wasn't an employer of Snowsoft. He just took the, the, the code off the system and released it not as a Snowsoft employer, but as a, in, an individual consultant. So we're looking at an information leakage here rather than Snowsoft deciding that they want to uh, go against you know, what Compaq have already said to them. Um, at the point that it was released, they'd already pitched Compaq and, and sorry, HP, and HP had already said that they weren't interested in any form of consultancy or a relationship between Snowsoft. Let, let me jump in real quick. Uh, one of the one of the components of what what I call an ideal disclosure metric is y that when the software vendor doesn't do anything, you disclose the vulnerability information. You don't necessarily need to disclose an exploit because script kiddies, in general, most of them can't do too much with vulnerability information. But you put a point and click exploit out there. And all of a sudden, everybody gets hurt. So you know, there, there, I take disagreement with even the way that this individual consultant went about it. He put out, he put out the exploit code, and now everyone, now HP is faced with either fix it, which obviously they didn't want to do, or you know, go after Snowsoft in some way, which is what they're doing. They don't want to fix it now because they're taking it off the market. <laughs> Let me just make one quick comment, too, since you had started to ask me the question, just to, to answer it briefly. The law, the, the DMCA, um, is a law, and we have to still stay within the law. Regardless of what we say here in terms of proper vulnerability research and disclosures, the law is the law. We have to now wait and see what happens when it goes to court. And no. You, neither you nor I were there when that law was written. We didn't, at least I didn't offer any opinions to it. I don't know if you did or not. But in fact, the law is on the books. Laws can, of course, be changed. And if there's proper legal process to get those laws changed, that can be done. So it would be improper for us to sit here and say that a law that is on the books is wrong until it has its day in court and is challenged, and let's see what happens. It may actually get overturned. I mean, this, this will be an interesting case to see what happens. Well, it's, it's give, and, give and take on both sides. I'm sure Scott will want to add to this, but this is why the intermediate groups, the search CCs, for example, exist to provide that conduit between the researcher and the, and the uh, vendor. 
If that conduit doesn't work, and in many cases it does break down, then it's up to the integrity of the researcher as to whether they want to continue to work with that vendor or to release. Unfortunately, where they cross the line is not just releasing, as was mentioned earlier, the fact that there's a vulnerability, but now here's the accompanying exploit code where we can now take this theory and make it practical. That's clearly crossing the line. That's where we, we are now irresponsible in terms of disclosure. And certainly, there's no law against it, but this is the ethics of if you're going to be in the line of work of, for looking for vulnerabilities, if that's what you like doing, there needs to be some type of ethical procedure involved in it. And certainly, you may reach a point where a vendor is not being cooperative, but there are other means you should go through first before releasing the exploit, if, if even release of the exploit is proper. Well, know. on those things that you've brought up, and I think it ties in all together, um, with the DMCA law, I had heard that there is a, an exception written into the law for auditors, and, uh, and I don't know, and I'd like to find clarification if possible on that, that issue. Um, but even like the SNMP vulnerability that came out, um, there's reports that some of the major vendors knew about the SNMP vulnerabilities two years prior to them being exploited. So if we're going to have responsible disclosure, where do we get responsible response? And even though we say we can go to CERT CC, we've heard tonight that it does take them a while until you have so many reports. Where do the folks who are discovering vulnerabilities feel that they're being taken seriously? And unless you're the NSA, does the vendor really listen? So that might be a question to consider. And then uh, look at where you've, you've seen responsible reporting or uh, attempts. And I do believe that you shouldn't release the exploit code. Um, but I do think there has to be another push on the vendor side. Yeah, so, so ideally, uh, it would be great if the vendor found all these, fixed them, and kind of went out without telling anyone and auto-updated and everything was fine, right? Um, it happens all the time. Right? Yeah, so yeah. that probably won't happen. <laughs> that, that's not going to happen. But the other part of that is, and, you know, there are other efforts pushing to make this happen, is, you know, better default installs so that, you know, the victims who put these OSs on their machine at home uh, you know, aren't so wide open. And there were a lot of configuration issues and there's been a lot of effort, I know, to tighten, tighten these up. But a lot of the things we heard initially were that themselves. I mean, there are services that just should not even be running. You know, at home, do you, do you need SNMP? Probably not. You know, so there, there are a whole lot of things that, that just come up on your machine that were there for convenience or maybe made for an enterprise network that you're not gonna need elsewhere. Yet a small office brings up a bunch of them Next thing you know, you know, they're involved in a big DDoS wave and they don't know why. So, you know, the vendors are working on it. I, I'd just like to go back to your comment about the SNMP vulnerabilities being known for two years. Um, quite often, uh, vulnerabilities are co-discovered by more than one researcher. Um, in the case of the recent OpenSSH KBD init vulnerability, that was discovered by more than one person. The, uh, the first person discovering it um, about, about two months after the uh, the second guy discovered it, who's an ISS employee. Um, I'm not sure in the case of the um, SNMP stuff, but I mean, you, you could say the same for any vulnerability. You know, when a vulnerability is discovered, for all you know, someone could have discovered it before you and they could have been exploiting systems covertly around the internet for the last two years. Um, referring back to the comment about Marcus, about the uh, the wildfire, I, I think that uh, the wildfire has already happened. Um, the, in the, if, if you look at the, a graph of uh, the amount of vulnerabilities discovered in the last two years compared to you know six years previously, it shot up sub substantially. Um, and it's becoming harder and harder for researchers to find vulnerabilities. Um, they're becoming they're finding new types of uh, vulnerability. For example, the unsigned integer issues, uh, Apache Open SSH. Um, but you'll find that uh, if you speak to researchers, they are having to scrape the barrel um, as far in, as, far as uh, finding vulnerabilities goes. Mike, do you want to move on to the next question? Sure. We have a few more hands. Oh, okay. Um, Could someone pass the mic down? That's real. I think it's, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Speak real loud. Okay. Um, two, two questions. Um, oh, for, for anyone who cares to answer. 
Do, um, do you see a place in a responsible disclosure, or do you see a place in a ideal future for liability of software vendors when bugs are found in critical infrastructure for allowing bad code to, to get out? And my second question is, do you, do you see a place in the life cycle of a bug um, for full disclosure of the vulnerability to the community at large? Um, and at what point, at what point do you, do you think full disclosure of the vulnerability um, could be important for things like independent verification that the patch actually fixed it, um, independent verification that intrusion detection systems actually detect it, and so forth. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, there's a time and a place to, to talk about exploit, um, about, about exploit code. Um, I wasn't actually asking about exploit code. I was okay. the, the vulnerability details. Okay. And okay, my the, yeah, my question is, what is that time? Okay. Um, I mean, let let's start off by acknowledging that there are that there are at least two different communities with competing interests here. Um, the academic community would like to see as much information about the vulnerability as possible, and they've got they've got a legitimate um, interest in getting that information. Take for instance, um, format string bugs. We're still we're still kind of grappling with what the full scope of that family of vulnerabilities looks like. We're still trying to understand what kind of coding practices are going to be needed to make sure that we don't have, uh, that we don't have those very often. The academic community, the research community has got a legitimate interest in seeing vulnerability data for, for that purpose. The other community, though, is the community of users, and they've got a legitimate uh, interest in, in not having their systems hacked. You've, you've got conflict between those two, and you're not going to be able to resolve it. What you're going to have to, what we're going to have to do is find some kind of a, you know, we're going to have to find some, some balance point where we as a community perceive that the, um, um, that the predominant interests have shifted from the users initially to the academic community. So to, to, to sum it all up, initially, I don't believe that there's a, that there's, that there's, I believe there's almost never a need to publicly discuss the specifics of a vulnerability in the initial term after releasing a patch. Because at that point, you're trying to give customers and users every opportunity to get the patch on and get their systems protected before the attacks come. After a certain point, a lot of people have talked about 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. After a certain point, the interests of the academic community start to predominate. We can assume that any users who are interested in putting the patch on will have done so already, and now we can, and now we can release the, um, uh, the vulnerability information and let the academic community start to use it. In the case of uh, open source software, um, we, we've discussed that the script kiddies can't really do much with a, an advisory, but um, the, the people we really need to worry about who are developing exploits um, can quite easily determine uh, what the specifics of a vulnerability by just looking at the patch file for, uh, for some source code. So I, I don't necessarily think that disclosing um, all vulnerability information at a certain point is such a bad thing. Um, if you look at any patch file, you can see which, which area of code it's affected, which function. Um, someone that has the ability to develop an exploit would also have the ability to determine what that, what, which bug that uh, patch is fixing. So in the case of open source software, I, I don't think it's such a big issue. Uh, go ahead. Real quickly, your first part of your question had to do with liability. And should we make software companies liable for issuing buggy code, for example? Um, are there any contexts in which we should do that? Are there any particularly egregious cases yeah. in which well, that could? You also mentioned critical infrastructures. Uh, the government has long had its own code written, of course, for government systems, like the space shuttle, for example. It doesn't run an operating system that you can buy at Best Buy. Uh, it, it's coded by individuals who are very, very meticulous. Each line of code is documented. It's reviewed by many people. It, it's a very painful and expensive process. But you really do wind up with bug-free code. And of course, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to write you know, the operating system for the space shuttle versus Windows XP. What did it cost to write Windows XP? Hundreds, I mean, of, millions hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> okay. But um, placing liability on software vendors is certainly an option. But I don't know of any software vendor that in their EULA, the end user license agreement, where they hold anything in there other than buyer beware. 
um, once you install the software, it's your software. They don't maintain configuration control after that point. It's, it's up to you, the user, to configure it properly, to close any openings, to apply the patches, to maintain that piece of software. It would be ideal, certainly, if we could figure out some way of, of assigning liability, but I think it's a, a, a task that's too far and also doesn't make a lot of sense, mainly because the ownership of that code is sort of out of the hands of the developers at that point. However, it's an, it's an option that still needs to be discussed and taken up. It's worthy of, of debate and uh, something that's um, an interesting thought as we get better at what we're doing with software. Could I, let me just counter that. I think that the due diligence enters into it somewhere. As long as they've, if they have done something that's egregious, then they, they ought to be held responsible. But, but who decides that and how much testing is enough? It's I very think difficult. I can do that. You, you could? Yeah, okay. So, so your configurations that you put out, I mean, everybody uses those and then they still get hacked and so are you responsible? That's a good question. Nah, I'm yeah. kidding. Can you turn your mic on? Is, is the liability issue clear at all? Um, I've, I've seen the analogy made e even in the last couple of days about, well, how Ford and Firestone are, are being held responsible for uh, tire issues. But that's, it seems to me that's not an apt analogy. Um, if, if the issue was somebody sitting on the side of the road shooting out people's tires, neither Ford nor Firestone would be responsible for that. Maybe the tires could have been made bulletproof. Or maybe there's a structural weakness where a slingshot might be able to take the tire out. But the liability issue is not nearly so clear as, as it is with many mainstream product liability cases. Would you agree? I don't think it's going to go to court until somebody gets killed. If, if there is loss of life and it can be proven that it was a problem with the software that caused that loss of life, then there might be a court case. But if it's monetary losses or inconvenience losses or you know, a hacked web page because you didn't close a particular you know, access that's going to be a hard time holding up in court against the software manufacturer. But that's not to say it certainly could be tried. Take, take, go find a good lawyer. And matter of fact, there's one next door on the, the trial over there. <laughs> right. I, I'm going to jump topics a little bit. And uh, let's discuss uh, new threats as a result of irresponsible disclosure. What threats do you guys see occurring now that weren't occurring before as a result of current practices and what threats do you see developing in the future? New threats? I, and, I and I'm putting them all on the spot. So. <laughs> I, I, don't, uh, I don't think there are new threats uh, coming from, from um, irresponsible reporting. Um, it's, it's already about as bad as it can be. Um, and we've seen, oh, you know, I, I can start citing them. We, we've seen um, lots and lots of cases um, where somebody uh, posts exploit code to the web and you immediately see people starting to get hacked. Now, that's unnecessary. That's the cost of irresponsible vulnerability handling. On the other hand, let's take the, let's, you know, let's hold vendors to account as well. We've also seen cases where vendors have refused to, to, um, um, to fix vulnerabilities in their software and the result is that their customers you know, their customers are hacked long after the point where, uh, where they didn't need to be. I mean, there's responsibility on both sides. The other part of the uh, thing about exploit codes released and then suddenly there's lots of hacks, um, you know, there's people who install and then hook up to the internet and they're being scanned, probed, uh, attempted attacks to them right away too. So there are people out there apparently with a lot of more time on their hands than us. So. The one uh, example I, I would like to refer to is uh, Gobble's recent, well, not, not so recent publication of uh, Sculpt.c, the Ap Apache exploit for uh, FreeBSD. Um, a few days after that, we saw the first sightings of the Sculper worm, um, which pretty much used his, used his exploit in a pretty trivial way. Um, the worm wasn't written very well. Uh, it could have been written a lot better, and I think if it had been written a lot better, um, it, it could have caused a lot of problems. Um, I think certainly what we will see in the future is less time between vulnerabilities being discovered and the worm for that vulnerability being um, being seen on the internet. Um, uh, and obviously, with uh, with worms, you ha you don't just have issues of sites being hacked. You have issues with backbone bandwidth being used on backbones and network congestion and other issues. I'm a 
This was the case with uh, the, the Apache exploit. Um, Gobbles actually released that because uh, Internet Security Systems claimed it, it wasn't exploitable on non 64 bit operating systems. Um, I, I think that um, there is a place for exploit code, but not being, to prove that it's exploitable doesn't, it doesn't mean sending it to bug track or public fora. You, you could just send it to you know, the, uh, the vendor or give them a private demonstration that it's you know, possible to exploit it. I, I don't think there's any need to uh, publish it on a large scale to uh, lists such as bug track. Yeah, yeah speak, speaking as a, <laughs> as a vendor, if you send me exploit code, you've got my attention. Um, you know, you can, there, there, there are two angles to this question. The first one, let's kind of take them in reverse order. Let's take the question of why go out to a public mailing list. If you believe that the vendor hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, worked reasonably with you, and you believe that the only way to get their attention is to, um, you know, is to prove that that, uh, that, that vulnerability re really exists, um, why, why not go to CERT? Vendors are gonna listen to CERT. If CERT shows up and says, hey, we've tried this in our lab and this thing works, the vendor is absolutely gonna listen to them. But uh, I can tell you from, from my own personal experience that when people post, um, in the vast majority of cases, where, um, where people post uh, exploit code for a vulnerability involving one of our products, they, they either haven't contacted us, they've sent their report to a, you know, to a, you know, to the, um, um, you know, to, to some random address at Microsoft and said, that constitutes alerting the vendor. Um, if, if, I'm in, if I'm in communication with somebody who's found a vulnerability and they hand me exploit code and it does something pretty serious, you've absolutely got my attention. I am, you know, I know that they can go to a mailing list. You know, it's not like I can sit, it's not like I can hold my cards and bluff them. So, I, you know, why would I? My goal is I, I wanna find the vulnerabilities because I wanna kill them. You know, until I get those vulnerabilities taken care of and patched, all of my customers are at risk. And none of those customers are gonna react well if they get hacked through something that I blew off. So I'm gonna take, you know, I'm, I'm gonna set the bar lower than it needs to be because the cost to doing a patch is, is much less than the cost to have extremely angry customers. But with that said, I also can't patch every single bug that somebody, that somebody brings to me. There are cases, and you'll see them all the time, where somebody will, will find a, a bona fide, from a technical standpoint, a bona fide vulnerability that in any reasonable scenario is just simply not exploitable. Now the reason that I can't build a patch for every one of those issues is because if I released all those patches, I'd, we'd, uh, we'd overwhelm system administrators, they wouldn't put the patches on, the result would be that they'd actually be less secure than if we, say, took them in a service pack or something like that. There's an appropriate vehicle for different levels of vulnerability. Um, and and we, we do try to stack them in the right bins. But at the end of the day, my goal is to get rid of every single vulnerability somebody brings to me.
just, just real quick, because my answer will be much shorter than my dear friend next door to me. On September 19th, we're going to publish our strategy for securing cyberspace. It's a fairly lengthy document. Well, if you don't mind, when you get it, it'll be on a website, it'll be a CD, and there'll be a paper copy. Take the website, because it's probably easier, and peruse it, and let us know what you think. It's the first time we've really tried to do this, and it, it's comprehensive from the home user through the small, mid-sized business, through federal governments, large enterprises, national systems, and global systems. It's a first stab, and we've built this with input from, a, wait a second, from around industry and private sector, as well as through government, to try and lay out this roadmap to do exactly what you're talking about, recognizing that there have been some starts over the years, going back to the mid to late 90s with PDD-63, for example, and the, some of the other critical infrastructure ideas. It takes a while for us to change this, this, this ship that's moving through the sea. It's almost like moving a, a battleship. You just don't give it a kick and it moves immediately right. We've come a long way. We've made a lot of mistakes. This is our, we think is a pretty good effort. Uh, those who've looked at it so far are concurring with what they're seeing. But we know when we publish it, we're still not going to have it correct. And this is where we now need the public feedback on September 19th when it gets published so that our February edition will be that much better and help us with this thing because we do want to do it right. We want to enable what you're talking about and make those, we can't fix today's systems overnight. You know that. It's what can we do though to set the groundwork for doing it right with the next generation of software, the next generation of the internet, the next generation of programmers, recognizing that we're just going to have to deal with what we currently have and it, it, it won't get fixed overnight. But what can we do to set the conditions to do it right with the next sets? Great. I appreciate it. And, and, and seriously, please, please give us the feedback once you see it in print. Because, of course, what you gave us, your input, who knows what we've done with it. Hopefully we've, we've played it back the way you intended it to be played back. But take a look at your part of it and let us know what you think and then give us the next round of feedback. This will be uh, at uh, whitehouse.gov stroke PCIPB. That's President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board. That site's up right now. It has the original 55 questions that we had circulated last winter, plus it has a general outline of what the strategy will look like. Currently, the strategy is in a, an alpha state if you want to compare it to software. Uh, we're floating it around inside of government. Uh, some industry C CIOs and CEOs are looking at it. It'll get a little wider look in the next couple of weeks, and then it goes to press. We have this normal lead time we have to do with, with um, printing publications. And then September 19th will be the rollout, both virtual as well as physical. And again, recognizing that what we publish is a start, and it'll need to have continued evolution. We may get some things wrong in there, but that's where we need the, the public feedback. So the next one in February, and the next one four months after that, et cetera, is that much better. Uh, no, actually, uh, it's, it's suggestions, recommendations, programmatics, uh, funding. Um, take a look at it when it comes out and just give us the feedback. It's, it's a very large document with probably a lot more detail than we had originally meant to put into it. We were going to try and keep it small. It's several hundred pages now because we've gotten such a, a large amount of feedback from the private sector as well as the public and uh, government sectors. I'm sorry? Well, take a, take, take a look at the document. There are things in there that re are requirements for the federal government. We, we can't write law. This document is not a legal binding document. That's what the Congress does. What we can do, though, is outline the, what the federal government has to do, because then it gets signed, eventually can be made into an executive order for federal uh, organizations to be, as you could call it, federal law. But for legal civil law, that has to go through the Congress, the normal lawmaking procedure. But again, take a look at it when it gets published and give us, give us your feedback then. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason that it, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the reason that that matters for, for vendors is because the, um, you know, the size of the, of the federal customer. I mean, there, there's a lot of money at stake in terms of federal procurement and, you know, that's going to make it incumbent on vendors, you know, just the power of the purse is going to, is going to bring, um, is, is going to encourage vendors to comply and to provide them with products that they can use to meet their requirements. We hope it goes to both.
There certainly was commitment. Um, the Orange Book was a little difficult. Of course, now we have the common criteria, which I'm sure you've read through back to back, and it's more difficult than the Orange Book. We continue to try and get better at this, and it, we're, not, we're not perfect. We know that. Um, but it would be unfair to say there was no commitment. There certainly was commitment, and I don't know if you want to add to it from your angle, but um, it's not that this was just published and then laid on the sidewalk and ignored. Um, what we're trying to do is take a stab at setting a standard for the federal government, number one, to take what we are saying and actually practice it. In other words, if we're saying that security matters, then we, the federal government, need to start doing it ourselves. And then what we learn can then, should then be set as an example for the rest of industry. Now, that's not to, to prevent the private sector and home users to take the lead themselves, but it's absurd for the federal government to be preaching all this security stuff and not even practicing it ourselves. And not, not NSA-style practicing, you know, that, that type of security, but day-to-day -day operations. If I go into the Department of Treasury or Agriculture or any of the countless millions of PCs that we have and they're not patched or they're not running some type of antivirus software or we don't have firewalls in place or we're not using any type of security mechanisms that are currently available, that is absurd. And that's what we're finding, unfortunately, as we're doing our self-audits. And we're cleaning that up as best we can. What this will lay down then is a roadmap not just for the federal government but also for the private sector, the home users, large, small businesses, and that piece of it was not written by us. It was written by those sectors and providing that input to us as to how do they best feel they should be protecting themselves. So whatever sector you're from, find your section in there and take a look at it and see if it applies, see if it's well written or not, and what do we need to change to get it uh, correct. But let me get off the strategy and back to Yeah, every indication is that, that we plan to take uh, Instisic 11 much more seriously than any of the rainbow rules were ever taken. Uh, we were almost put in a position with the Rainbow Series where we were telling people they had to do something that industry wasn't really in a position to allow them to do. And it, it, when you're writing policy, the one thing you have to do is make sure that you write policy that people can follow. Because if you write policy that people can't follow, you, you kind of become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a mistake I think we made with Rainbow. We, it was, it, it, was, it was good, but it was just too ambitious. It, it wasn't something that we could really follow through on. I, this time, we think we can. No, I mentioned something. The Unix system, the Odin systems, uh, Lupin at that point, took a real aggressive role in the Unix system. Uh, and you can see that in the vendors. Again, the issue is coming from liability only vendors. Well, from the legal side, I, I trust you're working with your congressman in terms of legislation. <laughs> that is an issue, yeah. Uh, there are many um, that do, and your, your representative may not. But um, let me see if I can find you the right groups if, if you're not able to find the right ones to plug into to get the type of legislation you're looking for. From our perspective, of course, we don't write laws uh, up in the executive branch. You have to go you remember our basic civics classes in, in elementary school, yeah. the legal system has to do that side of it. So what I would encourage you to do, of course, is work through either your lobbyist groups or, or those who are working the Hill to get that type of legislation introduced and let it run the course and see if we can get the right wordings. I understand your frustration, and I think there's not a soul in here that's not equally as frustrated from their particular sectors. Um, 
part of this, of course, is the education level of our own bureaucracies within government. It's, it's taking a while to get people who really, no kidding, understand security, not only say it, but be able to walk it and have worked in those levels to rise up to a, an appropriate position in government where they can affect their lessons learned. Uh, we've been working with, as, you, as I'm sure you can appreciate, an older generation who didn't have to deal with this when they were down in the trenches. They're doing the best they can to, to grapple with this, this new world of, of information security and this, this phenomenon over the last 10 to 12 years that has exploded kind of unexpectedly. And so we have to give them a, a little bit of, of leeway for not fully grasping what you and I can do. But what we do know is that we're getting better at it. And we just ask you know, for the continued patience and that partnering with us to try and get it right as we make these attempts, like you've done with your, your uh, six pages for the strategy, continue to do that. But again, on the legislative side, work that through the Congress, through the lobbying process, the lawmaking process that I'm sure you're familiar with. To push that. On my list of t topics still to be discussed, uh, I have a question to the panel. How can we emulate and profile these kinds of attacks <laughs> against critical infrastructure, against businesses, uh, and, and how, how can we pr profile them to, to build better defenses? I think one of the things we, uh, metrics we use uh, when, when profiling different types of um, disclosure disclosure process is a uh, pyramid metric. The, uh, the top of the pyramid being uh, the, the uh, zeroth day when the vulnerability was first discovered. The bottom of the pyramid being when it goes public, uh, the, the wider the pyramid, uh, the more people uh, that know about it. Um, in the case of a uh, black hat disclosure model, you'll have a very narrow pyramid which widens quickly at the bottom because um, the, the information will be kept within a close-knit group within uh, the computer underground, um, and then maybe it gets leaked uh, 30 days later and someone posts a bug track, and then very quickly a lot of people find out about it. Uh, maybe that post will be with a, a working exploit, um, or even or just a binary posted to PacketStorm. Uh, what we're trying to work on is a uh, responsible disclosure metric, which would see a more even pyramid uh, at the top of the pyramid, you'd still have the vulnerability being discovered in a closed, controlled environment. Um, at some point during in the pyramid, you'd have um, vendors such as Microsoft working on um, developing patches for that vulnerability. Um, at the bottom, you'd still have um, public disclosure, full disclosure, whether it be a patch being released, and therefore um, inform all the information. You, you know, you may as well publish a full advisory because even with Microsoft publishing a a binary patch, you could still reverse engineer the patch and see what it's doing. Um, so, uh, and, and whilst we're, we're still disclosing all of the uh, vulnerability information at the bottom of the pyramid, um, we're still trying to protect critical infrastructure. So, maybe it would happen that the vulnerability is discovered in a controlled environment, Microsoft are notified, um, the patch would maybe then go to the government, the government would patch critical infrastructure, and then perhaps either CERT or the NIPC may release it into uh, the, the, uh, into the public domain. And I, I think that's something that, uh, that needs to be discussed, whether it's possible to have such a metric in today's world. Um, it's obviously not possible to account for every single bit of uh, information and every single vulnerability which are discovered. Uh, Microsoft recently signed several security companies, Razor Bindview, at stake into um, an agreement. Um, but, I mean, since, since they signed into that agreement, we've seen the same number, if not more, vulnerabilities being posted to fora such as BugTrack. Um, so I think it's definitely something that needs to be discussed, whether it is possible to have a a controlled way to process vulnerabilities through the various uh, sectors. Yeah, let me let me address that. Uh, <coughs> let me address that uh, so-called agreement. Um, it doesn't exist. Period. I would challenge you to show me. I would challenge anybody to show me anything that we have asked any customer to sign. Oh, okay. We have we have is this? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, we have not asked anybody 
to stop looking for vulnerabilities. We have not asked anybody to uh, conceal vulnerabilities. It isn't how we work. End of story. They're continuing to look for vulnerabilities. We're continuing to patch them. Take a look, for instance, um, bulletin 18 of this year IIS. Um, there's an at stake vulnerability um, that we patched uh, that we patched in, in that one. Um, Bindview, I don't think we've had one. We haven't had a report from Bindview in a while. When Bindview uh, sends them into us, we treat them just like any others. Same way with any finder. We are simply not in the business of trying to conceal these things. Did, we did are in the state business come of to you trying first? to fix them. Did that, did that state come to you first? Yeah. And do they, they send it in through are, are they Microsoft are, are, they are, they, are they bound by contract that if they disclosed it to anyone else first, then? No. The, okay. Absolutely not. Okay. That was my question. So an another comment about the vulnerabilities. Um, I think you mentioned the, the null session. Um, some things, you know, are put in there for functionality, and they get exploited later. So there's also things that you know may become uh, hard to design out. You might call them inherent vulnerabilities. And um, you know the other part of that is we're built on top of things with inherent vulnerabilities, and we're using them. Uh, you know TCP/IP. You know look at a lot of routing protocols, things like that. And you know, we talk about critical infrastructure. They're using what works, or what worked at the time, and they didn't know about vulnerabilities. They wouldn't have put it in if they knew, right? So these vulnerabilities come up later, and it may be exploiting what was actually a feature. And someone just didn't think about it. Let me give you an example. Uh, currently, Cisco only supports SSH version 1. They have been committed for four years to support SSH version 2. They have yet to do that. Well, it's a um, man in the middle attack. Yeah, it's better than Telnet, which is what they had before they put that in place, right? Or, or web access to configure your router. So people who are worried about it, go ahead and they get a serial cable, they hook up to the console port. So they don't allow these remote access problems to happen. If you're really worried about security, you, you can take care of the problem to a point. You don't have to run insecure uh, protocols and be vulnerable. But sure, yeah, you, know, you can pressure Cisco and I'm sure someday they'll come up with something better. Use Juniper instead. <laughs> Yeah, we discussed that for about an hour and a half, and we. Has anybody talked about how the effect it's going to be on that normally very wealthy Well, and how effective has it been? And, and that's what I was just saying. When the, the products come out, they've gone through the process, they're certified, and someone finds a vulnerability and codes up an exploit anyway. That's, that, the, that's the penetration testing part, part of the common criteria. But and that's also customized, if you look at it that way, customized each environment because the threat profile is different where you deploy it. That, that's a horrendous problem to try to exhaust yeah. on all possible vulnerabilities.
to, yeah. some, to some extent. And, and in fact, what, what we found is design guidance is much more effective than, than post-production uh, Yeah, so they'll probably problems. take care of 80% up to that point. I mean, sure, you don't, you're not just going to deploy something because it has the functionality and someone has a paper with a bunch of check boxes on it. Right. I mean, it, yeah, sure, it was tested and it was thought about where it was going to go. But you can't think of everything. Yeah, so extending the cycle. I, I work with R&D products. I mean, it's before their products, right? <laughs> so, so we try to help the process by fixing them way early. So now they go to product, and so, so maybe they want to rush it to market or something, and maybe something gets missed. You know, I, I don't know. But there, there are lots of processes in place. People are trying to fix things early. But you still have problems. You aren't going to be able to find everything, and you aren't going to be able to to check every conceivable way the product can be used because you're always going to have a user that, that finds some unique way to use it that you never thought the guy would find. And doggone it, he opens up a hole that you didn't think would be there. But it's um, not like you're deploying it knowing there's a vulnerability and hope they don't find right. it. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Security through obscurity. We know. That's not a true statement. No, probably not. I mean, SNMP is probably a bad example anyway. I mean, it's an insecure protocol. People adopted it for functionality. They tried to fix it along the way. No one wanted to fix it. You know, like Cisco doesn't want to put a new version of SSH. You know, people don't want to take SNMP v3. They don't want to protect it. But people are still using SNMP v1 because they, they want to gather stats. Matter of fact, we had even asked them to continue to delay, and they suggested that there was other circumstances happening at that time. It was about to go public, unfortunately, and then you're in this quandary of, does it get released through a source you don't want it released through, or do you want to have it released properly? Ulu was being very friendly. They had wanted to release, what, January, I believe? And we, we were... Right, December, that's correct, yeah, before Christmas, right.
So the other part of that is if, if people really understood it, they can figure out where else to mitigate the problem. You don't have to sit on your butt and wait for the manufacturer vendor to come up with a patch. I think that uh, the SNMP vulnerability is a, is a bad example because it, it's been part of uh, the, the kind of firestorm of vulnerabilities that have been discovered in the last two years. Um, we're going to, I doubt we'll see many more like the SNMP vulnerability um, in the future, mainly because people are, are being a lot more diligent about, um, well, you'd hope, <laughs> the, the, the way they write code. Um, I mean, it's one vulnerability. If if you look at the way that was disclosed against the amount of vulnerabilities being openly published to bug track every day, it, it plays you know a very small part in you know the the bigger picture. Uh, I hate to be a contrarian, but uh, LDAP also has similar and problems. And LDAP and, and IMAPD. There will and be there will be many more <laughs> SNMPs. These old families of, of protocols that go back for years. Researchers like those in Finland are pretty damn good at what they do, and uh, they have the resources, they have the brain power, and the funding. Uh, they're unlike the individual sitting in his basement, you know, at two o'clock in the morning looking for. They have a very meticulous process, to, and they will find more. And God bless them for doing it. It makes. Well, that, that's a good point, and I think the way you mitigate it is by increasing the number of auditors, not by not by creating a lot of auditors, but by making uh, by, by giving developers the skills to audit their own code. Um, we we ran nine thousand developers um, through uh, basic security techniques uh, during the month of January. We're continue we've got a continuing education program going on, with the idea being that that every uh, every developer needs to know how to write secure code. It's going to take us a while to get there. This isn't going to be something where we, you know, flip a switch and suddenly we're writing secure code. But the, you know, we don't teach it in schools. Um, we teach people in schools how to write functional software. We don't teach them how to write secure software. Vendors have got to start doing that as part of the part of the cost of doing business. But the second C program I ever learned how to write was, you know, what is your name? Yeah. Hello world. The other uh, appendix to, to this discussion is everybody here is, is involved in security. That's why you're here. And a lot of these companies that aren't having auditing done and, and aren't hiring auditors aren't represented here. And security is still viewed as this after the fact. Let's get the system up and running. You know, the president of the company wants to type his name and not have to worry about anything else to get in and he doesn't care. The, the solution, it, in, in my perspective, isn't easily presented here because everybody here has a demonstrated interest in security. The, the solution is talking to everybody else that's not here ab about these needs.
Let me make a very unfair statement that may piss off a few of y'all. <clears throat> Please, yeah, that's what we're here for, right? It has to do with the term software engineering, and this goes to all of you who call yourself software engineers. I think it's a great term, but the term engineer kind of connotates somebody who's had a fundamental amount of, exp of training, uh, has been mentored by a professional engineer, has uh, done the apprenticeship programs, has built themselves up to the point where they can then be, in most cases, board certified to use the term engineer, like the professional engineer licensing, for example. Software engineers, unfortunately, don't have that yet. And this is something that the software engineering community has got to come to grips with. This is not something that the government's going to mandate or whatever. We really need to have the community do this to, to become a professional organization and to treat themselves as, if we're going to use the title engineer, then as professionals that have that growing process. So you don't hire a 17-year-old right out of high school and have them writing you know, core code for your, whatever it is your, your software is. What experience does a 17-year-old have? You're certainly not going to let him go out and design the the steel that goes underneath some bridge someplace. Not until they're probably in their 50s are they doing that, because you want to bring them up and get that level of responsibility there. Unfortunately, that mindset is something we're, that we're just not quite there yet. I know a, a few companies are, are, are doing that, but it's very hard because it is hard to find good programmers. And in fact, the most creative ones are the youngest ones. But what they have working against them is the experience. So the challenge then for the, the software engineering community then is how do you make the professional side of engineering apply to the writing of software? And how do you professionalize uh, this, this profession, per se? It's, it's been there for many years, actually. I mean, software engineering has been around. These are the people who, who write code for the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. They understand how to make reliable code, safe code. And people are just misusing the title. Yes. So to, to say they're a software engineer is, is not true. So I got a master's in computer engineering, and software engineering was what I did. Mm -hmm. I got out of software engineering because everybody and their brothers, a coder, a programmer, this point and click stuff, and, and claim you know, an engineer. Sure. So, so now I said, forget this. So I read, you know, decline and fall the American programmer, and I go, enough. Yep. I'm, I'm not going to program anymore. And I, I believed in software engineering. We went through, you know, I got the company I was working for at the time to, to buy into the CMM. We had SEI come out mm -hmm. and rate them. You know, they thought they were going to do great. They, didn't do so great. <laughs> they, they improved. Um, and that process is still around. And people who write serious code, um, you know, again, take that seriously. So I was at, what, General Dynamics uh, a couple months ago. And they were touting that they had three locations that were level five. That's yeah, software that's engineering. Yeah. That, that's not just throwing code together. That's right. How do we institutionalize that? Yeah, how do you spread it? Across I mean, this is like you say, this is get back into the schools. I mean, Matt Bishop has been running around for like 15 years mm -hmm. trying to say, we need to learn how to program right. and get this in schools. And it comes with experience and time. So you have to learn how to do it first. Right. You, can, you can start to put in concepts, but to understand everything all at once is, is hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Absolutely. So there's been a secured uh, or a, a failed security effort under CMM as well. I think a couple efforts have tried. Can someone explain what the CMM thing is? Okay. Oh, well. Pass this guy a geek card. There. <laughs> <laughs> Stick it on his forehead. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, hey, yeah. I'll, I'll chime in. And the pay scales. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when they get software, because you're not going to get software and delivery Right. And that's market forces are driving what you're talking about. This desire to, to well, you could probably answer it better than I could.
It depends if you're charging for updates too, right? Yeah, first, it doesn't take into account first to market and what sales you lose, and, and that's that's the problem. Right. Yeah. One of the one of the one of the traditional problems with um, you know with some of the highly structured processes is that that you you become better at filling out the forms. Um, tracking the process than you do at, at actually producing and you know actually producing code. Um, there's there's a, I mean there's there's a balance point and you know we could uh, you know we could all you know I mean the, you know, the entire industry could could change the business model you know start writing you know CMM level five uh, code but it would be slow and it would probably you know and and you might not be willing to to uh, to pay for the you know for the cost of that development model. Yes. Right. You're going to get less functionality and, and more bloatware. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Yeah. But but definitely though the, the the point you're making though is is right. I mean that 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 uh, um, I mean CMM may not be you know the perfect process, but clearly we need to be improving the the state of of, uh, of software development. I mean you know we we. we there just isn't an alternative. It's becoming, but but you start looking at the at the companies that are, uh, you know, that are making an effort to do that, and and you know, scratch your head and say, well, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Well, it's it's market forces. Security is becoming more important to customers. Customers are, are going to vote with their pocketbooks, and and uh, you know, and the, the software developer or the software uh, uh, vendors are, are going to respond. Because I want to because I want to sell software. I they said oh, it earlier. I mean, the government's a big buyer, mm -hmm. and and that's a big force. I, uh, tell me more. What what, what course? When you work for Microsoft, you learn not to take anything personally. <laughs> <laughs> you had a big target on your forehead. Yeah. Right, right, and they're working off the official Microsoft curriculum, and this is one of the external training courses for for like your MCSE or something. I agree. I agree. The curriculums are changing. Um, I mean, remember we started. You know, we we you know started this you know this big push. You know, what is it? It's it's uh, it's the it's August, um, eight months ago. We started um, the first changes we made were to our internal processes. The um, the coursework that the developers at Microsoft are learning start with security, and we are developing new courseware. The courseware takes a little time to. I mean, you know, there's a you know, there's a there, you know there's a development process for the curriculum itself. There's you know we beta test the curricula. You know we have to put them all together, get the get the trainers trained, and so on and so forth. So there's kind of a long pipe. 
But I mean, I've seen some of the new courseware that's going to be coming out later this year, and and security plays a much much more prominent role in it. So unless you tie that into, you know, someone using it to do something related to HIPAA and in, in that area. Wait a second. How does this have stopped? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a second. Yeah. Got to correct another canard. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, um, I'm trying to remember what the name of the ship is. Uh, what actually happened, this was the uh, Navy Smart Ship Program. The USS Skates. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the uh, Smart Ship Program. Yeah. And um, the, uh, um, the stories were rampant that, uh, um, that there had been a software failure and just left this poor, you know, this poor boat out in the water and they had that to tow it back here. No, 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 no. Um, it, 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 in actuality, what happened was that a technician um, um, actually changed the hardware and forced data into the system that he couldn't have put in um, under normal conditions to cause a failure. And, and he did cause a failure. Um, you know, it wasn't something that could have happened under normal conditions, um, and he literally had to, had, to, had to change hardware to cause that crash. Let me offer a, a brief summation, and then there's, we have some information on responsible disclosure everybody's welcome to. Some of the panelists will stick around, so if you have uh, more questions, please feel free to, to come and approach them individually. The point of this, and I, and I think we've gotten to it, is that everyone here, the community is represented up here, everyone in the audience, working together can drive the people that aren't represented here in order, drive them to do more secure things. If all of your companies, if all of your software companies, if all of you that are auditors, if all of the systems that you're responsible for become more secure over the next few years, then the market will force stocks down on the insecure companies and then they'll have to hire more people like you or hire you or you know and and everybody will be better off the only way to get to that point is to keep this dialogue in a positive light instead of having some people in uh, at, at one end of the spectrum bashing the other people at the other end of the spectrum and and what we hope this will start is bringing everyone toward the middle and saying hey you know m maybe he's got a little bit he, he thinks this can be done in two weeks and he wants this to be done in two months, but eventually there's got to be a middle ground and everybody's got to give a little bit to get to that middle ground and then hopefully we'll, we'll all be more secure. Uh, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this off there. Please feel free. We have documentation on, on responsible disclosure, both from Global Intersect, from Microsoft. Thank, thank you all for coming.